we just say praise be to your name. And everybody say, Amen. You can be seated. If only I could go back and change some things. Set things straight. I wish I had a do-over. I've made choices. I've lost out. I've wished a thousand times I could go back and try again. It's hard not to imagine what might have been. If I had just stopped to think. If I had just done as I was told. If I hadn't thought I knew it all. Why didn't I just take a few deep breaths? It took one second to listen. Maybe my life would be better. Maybe there wouldn't be such a high price to pay. Things would be different now. I wouldn't have so many regrets. But is everything lost? Can I just get a do-over? Is there a way back to new beginnings? Because regret can mean a new beginning. When it's given to the one who produces a repentance. A repentance that delivers me from my grief. The one who takes my mistakes. And somehow redeems me through them. Who tells me I'm not the sum total of all my regrets? He tells me not to look back. Because there's nothing there to see. I am not my mistakes. He is faithful and just to forgive me. I just have to ask him. And then I can look straight forward. Forget what is behind me. And strain towards what is ahead. And walk away with all regrets erased by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Every day I'm given a clean slate. A clean slate. I get a clean slate. That's good news, amen? If you have your Bibles, turn to Joshua chapter 8. You know, last week we looked at the uh, devastating defeat of Israel in Joshua chapter 7. And the question of chapter 8, when you start reading through it, is how do you recover from a loss? How do you come back after defeat? How do you find victory in your life after a failure? And I'm sure this is what Joshua and the people of Israel are wondering after this loss at Ai. They're still mourning the death of these 36 soldiers. Remember, Israel's a nation of over a million people, and they just lost in battle to a city that just has 12,000 folks. So how do you come back from that? And when you start applying it into your own life, you know, that this, this question of, of failure, and, and we've all had failure in our life at some point, and recovering from failure and walking in victory, that's the question I see in chapter 8. You know, Thomas Edison famously said he didn't fail 1,000 times making the light bulb, he just found 1,000 ways it didn't work. Because every failure is an opportunity to learn. So Henry Ford once said that mistakes were an opportunity to begin again, but more intelligently. Joshua and the people are going to have to go back to the place where they were just defeated. So when we fail, we don't give up because we know that failure is not final. Now, they aren't going to make the same mistake twice in a row. You know what's worse than making a mistake? It's making it twice in a row and not learning from your first mistake. So one of their mistakes was not seeking the Lord first before the battle, but what you see in chapter 8 is you're going to hear directly from the word of the Lord to Joshua. And And God gives Joshua this encouraging word. Let's start with verse 1. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city, and his land. So the first thing the Lord is going to tell Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed. That may sound familiar because God has told him that before. 
But in the process of restoration, you know, you're going to run into certain roadblocks that can feel very paralyzing in your life. One of those is fear. The other is discouragement. And Joshua needed to hear this over and over again from God. Just the same encouragement we read in Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. And there are certain commands when you're reading through the Bible you see over and over. Like God keeps reminding us, uh, love the Lord your God, right? He keeps saying, be holy. He keeps saying, worship the Lord. He keeps saying to repent. He keeps saying, keep my commandments. He, he keeps saying, be strong and courageous. And of course, do not fear. Why? Because we're a fearful people. You turn on the news and you hear all about the wars and the rumors of wars and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and inflation and every other ad now is a political uh, campaign. We can't forget with everything that's going on around us that God knows the beginning from the end, right? That when you get to the end of the Bible, you find out Jesus wins, but the Lord knows that we need constant reminders in the meantime because he doesn't want us to live in a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. And so God also gives Joshua a promise of victory. Look at this. He says, see, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land. This is similar to what he told Joshua before Jericho when he said, I have given Jericho into your hand. Past tense, have given. It's a certainty. The total judgment of Ai will be like that of Jericho, except this time they can take some of the plunder. That's the only difference. In other words, he's already given them victory over Ai. So I don't know what in your life you're facing right now, but God has already given you the victory if you just trust in him. So he tells us that you're, you're more than conquerors through Christ. Amen? Is that good news? So you just keep going. You keep moving ahead. You know, I used to listen to this uh, singer named Ron Cannoli all the time. And he did this song once where he said, you know, if you're going through hell, you don't stop. You, you, you keep going, right? You go ahead. You go ahead. You go ahead. Right? It's just keep moving forward, knowing that Christ and through Christ, like, you're going to get through this. And then, and then there's this calling in this verse of just complete trust in God. Look at what he says. Take all the fighting men with you. Take all the fighting men. Don't just take two to 3,000 like you did before. You need to move forward in faith, right? You need to be all in. Don't just limp into AI. Take your mighty men, the, the warriors, your greatest warriors, and move forward in complete trust, now, I know that there's a tension as you're reading through this book of, uh, as there always is, between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, right? So this is, God has given them the city, but they still need to move forward in faith. It's both of those operating. But in that process of just letting God, you know, I was reading um, this book by David Jackman um, on the book of Joshua, and he said this, listen, he said there was this man, he, he wanted to know greater victory in his Christian walk, and somebody told him, you've got to let God do that for you. And so um, he, he went home and he cut out these letters, L-E-T-G-O-D, let God, and then he hung it up. But then when he got home that night, he noticed the D had fallen down, and then all he saw was L-E-T-G-O, <laughs> And he felt like God was telling him, well, maybe that's the way I let God, by just letting go, <laughs> right? Just letting go of my, you know, ceasing the struggle, in other words, just like no longer wrestling and striving, but just resting effortlessly in Christ. 
But through that process, God's going to make it clear that it's time to deal with the problems of the past. Look at verse 2. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, only its spoil and its livestock. You shall take his plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. So God's given the promise right here, right? It's this affirmation, right? It's time to deal with Ai. Again, it's a picture that failure isn't final because as, as soon as they deal with the sin in chapter 7, as soon as they deal with that, God's forgiveness is there. Right? His anger is completely removed, and he's saying, you need to go forward. Why? Because he's the God of the second chance. We've talked about that here. You know, I just praise God for that. that you remember when we were going through the book of Jonah, and like right in the middle of the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, it says, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. A second time. Arise and go to Nineveh, right? And that's how God works. Israel cannot just go around Ai. They need to go to Ai a second time, right? You may need to go back to the place you failed and and through Christ give it another attempt, right? Go back to that place where you were humiliated, where you were weeping before the Lord, where you cried and you're just, you're just trying it again, but this time through the Lord's power, through his strength. I see this over and over in scripture when like, okay, maybe when you're reading about Jacob and Jacob deceived his brother Esau, and there was a point where Jacob was told by the Lord, you need to go and talk to your brother. Go back to your homeland and face your brother that you deceived. Elijah hid from Ahab, King Ahab, for three years until God told him, I want you to go back and I want you to confront King Ahab. The prodigal son, he he completely squandered his inheritance. And then he said, I'm going back to my father and I'm going to confront the mistakes of the past and seek reconciliation. Peter denied even knowing Jesus, but on the shoreline of that sea, he came face to face with the resurrected Christ and was restored. So sometimes you've got to revisit the past and deal with it, but don't misunderstand me in this. I'm not saying you've got to stay in the past. Robert Smith, in Exalting Jesus and Joshua, said, the past is oftentimes a necessary place to visit, but it's a terrible place to live. (laughs) So you don't become a prisoner of your past, but we understand it better and we deal with the problem. So AI is like this metaphor for all of us of not just avoiding our past or going around it, but allowing God to work in our life so we can experience victory where we failed in the past. You know, when Christ came to earth the first time, you know, he came to save us from the sins of the past. I remember when I was a kid playing, you know, before we had iPads, we had this thing called an Etch-A-Sketch. You remember that? (laughs) The Etch-A-Sketch, and you'd be making a a picture on there, and then you just turn that wheel just a little too sharp, and all of a sudden, a big line go off this way. Well, I think in, in life, it feels like that. You know, you may sin or fail, or you make a mistake, and, and all of a sudden, the, the picture starts getting distorted, and it starts to take a turn for the worse, and you may think the picture's ruined, but then God just shakes things up. He just shakes things up, and all of a sudden, you've got this clean slate because God's mercies are new every morning, right? So today is not yesterday. You know, we lay our sins at the cross, and we keep moving forward. And then we listen to actually what God has to say. We listen to his instructions. Look at verse 3. So Joshua and all the fighting men arose to go up to Ai, and Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them out by night. So God puts people around Joshua 
that will fight with him. And I think we all need that. Of course, he sends the best fighters here, the mighty men. And I'm just going to read through this, these verses. And he commanded them, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all you remain ready. Verse 5, And I and all the people who are with me will approach the city, and when they come out against us as before, we shall flee before them, and they will come out after us until we have drawn them away from the city, for they will say they're fleeing from us just as before, so we will flee before them. Then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize the city, for the Lord your God will give it into your hand. And as soon as you have taken the city, you shall set the city on fire. You shall do according to the word of the Lord. See, I've commanded you. So Joshua sent them out, and they went to the place of the ambush and lay between Bethel and Ai, to the west of Ai. But Joshua spent that night among the people. Okay, so you see the plan here. 30,000 are told, okay, this is how we're going to divide everybody up. Joshua lays out the plan. Joshua's saying, I'm going to be with this 5,000, and we're going to approach the city right from the front, but the majority of the army is going to be behind the city. And as we approach the city, can we, do we have that strategy, battle strategy picture? Okay, that might look a little confusing, but you can see there the red, right? This is Joshua approaching the city. And as they approach the city, they're going to, AI is going to look at you and say, this is the same as before. They've just got this little battalion of soldiers. And, and, and so when they start fleeing, AI sends all of their people to chase after them. And when they do, the majority of the army who is behind the city then goes in, takes the city, and then sets it on fire. Now, it's interesting that God's strategies are not always the same. As I'm reading through this passage, it may even look confusing. You're seeing all the arrows and you got everybody. But his, his battle strategies, you know, he doesn't do the same thing that he did yesterday. They're not going to defeat AI the way they defeat Jericho. It's an entirely new strategy. Because we serve a God who is so creative and boundless in how he works his purposes. And I think he's very intentional with this because he doesn't want us to just depend on a formula. He wants us to actually trust in him, to seek him. And I think it, it so that we resist the temptation to make that, that methodology an idol. So the way Israel crossed the Red Sea was different from how they crossed the Jordan. Remember how they crossed the Red Sea? Moses lifted up his staff and the waters parted. When they crossed the Jordan, God said, I want you to take the ark into the water and as you approach the middle of the river, it's going to part. It's a completely different strategy. You get to the New Testament. When Jesus starts healing people in the New Testament, every time it seems like he's doing it in a different way. One time he just speaks a word, right, to the centurion's servant in Matthew 8. For, for the leper, in Mark 1, he reaches out his hand and he touches him. For the blind man, he spits on the ground and mixes some saliva with dirt and makes some mud and puts it on his eyes. At the pool of Bethesda, Jesus healed a man by saying, take up your bed and walk. In Matthew 9, the paralyzed man uh, was healed by Jesus first declaring that his sins were forgiven. Uh, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law by rebuking her fever. When Peter cut off Malchus's ear, Jesus just reached out and touched his ear and it was completely restored. You remember the story of Lazarus, and after four days, Jesus actually went to where he was buried, into the tomb, and they removed the stone away, and he says, Lazarus, come out. So when you compare Jericho to Ai, the way God took the city in the past is not going to be the same way that he takes it now. That's, that's what I want you to see here. In Jericho, it was a miracle. God just worked a miracle and the wall just fell down. In Ai, the city's going to be defeated by these normal battle strategies. 
right? In Jericho, they're marching around the city in broad daylight. At Ai, this is going to focus on this covert operation. In Jericho, the whole army is supposed to stay together. At Ai, he divides the army in different places to attack from different, different angles, different strategies. So this means the, the means by which God works a miracle uh, for you may be different than how he worked it in the past. It, it may look differently because he doesn't want you to make an idol out of some method or strategy. He just wants you to seek him. Third point, align yourself with God's will. Look at verse 10. Joshua rose early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people of Ai. So what I see here is, is Joshua and the people actually do what God instructed them to do. So one of our great desires, as every believer should live this life, that we should have this desire to live in such a way that we're aligned with God's will. So this is at the heart of our relationship with him. This is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Like, trust in the Lord, right, with, with all your, your, your heart. Don't, don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. So before we can actually align ourselves with God's will, we actually have to understand what it is. So when you read his word, you're reading the principles of Scripture scripture and then you're praying to the father just like jesus did not my will but yours be done <laughs> amen and even in those moments where it doesn't seem like god's will is aligning with what i want you trust that god knows he knows what's best. He can, he can see the big picture that you can't see. And then you align your actions with God's will. It's not enough to just know God's will. You've got to act on it because faith without works is dead. So Noah didn't just in, receive instructions from God. He actually built the boat. So that's moving forward in faith. Now, I think the most difficult part of this is knowing God's timing. <laughs> Sometimes we sense God's direction and we don't know how long it's going to take. And you're crying out to God. Give me patience now. <laughs> Abraham and Sarah struggled with infertility for years before God answered the prayer of the promised son, Isaac. Joseph was told a dream when he was a young man and went through years of trial, sold into slavery, thrown into prison, and I'm sure wondering, God, what about that dream? You trust in God. Verse 15, and Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten before them and fled in the direction of the wilderness. So all the people who were, with, who were in the city were called together to pursue them. And as they pursued Joshua, they were drawn away from the city not a man was left in the Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. They left the city open and pursued Israel. So it's interesting, when you're reading chapter 7, I don't think it was just Achan's sin. I think there was an overconfidence or pride problem. I don't even see them seeking the Lord before they go into battle in chapter 7. But now, when they return, God uses the very thing that led to their defeat as a means to bring victory in their life. How? How? This time, the overconfidence is in AI. <laughs> they see this little battalion of 5,000 people, and they have such pride and overconfidence. They say, we defeated them last time. We routed them last time. Let's just go out after them. And God uses the very means of defeat that 
for Israel before because of their overconfidence, and now it's this pride of AI that actually leads to their destruction. Number four, find victory over strongholds. Verse 18, then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the javelin that's in your hand toward AI, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the javelin that was in his hand towards the city. So just like Moses, and, and you know, Moses would lift up his staff. Now Joshua's lifting up his javelin. He's stretching out his hand towards the city. And it's a signal that God's judgment is about to come in. And it's a signal to all the troops to go into the city and burn it. And I think as, as Joshua's lifting that spear, there's no doubt in my mind that he's not praying. You direct your prayers in faith towards the AI in your life. And then, what happens? Holy smoke, look at verse 19. And the men in the ambush rose quickly out of their place, and as soon as he had stretched out his hand, they ran and entered the city and captured it, and they hurried and set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked back, and behold, the smoke of the city went up to heaven, they had no power to flee this way or that, for the people who had fled to the wilderness turned back against the pursuers. So now AI is burning, the battle's won, the smoke is ascending to the heavens, and that area that was a stronghold of oppression in your life, that was an area of defeat in your life where you once failed, now God is turning that to victory for his glory. That's what happens. And when they saw the smoke, they knew because where there's smoke, there's fire. And that fire was that defeat of that stronghold of sin that you couldn't defeat on your own. But now with God on your side, victory is certain. Now I know, and one of the things that's difficult about preaching through this book, and I would even say reading through this book, is you're seeing God's judgment carried out on the evil of this city that was happening for centuries. These abominations that were happening in these cities, God's judgment just finally comes upon the entire society whose evil was so grotesque that God finally says, that's enough. Even the burning of the city is a picture of what's gonna happen at the end of days. When Christ returns to judge all the evil of this world, and even when he throws the devil and his angels into the lake of fire. And you say, well, why why does that have to happen? Because there can't be perfect love and perfect joy and perfect peace in God's kingdom if evil is present. Our God is a consuming fire, the Bible says. And he will destroy every rule and every authority and every power that is opposed to him. So that we can actually dwell with him in the new Jerusalem where he will wipe away every tear from our eyes where death shall be no more and neither shall there be mourning nor crying or pain anymore for the former things have passed away. All right, back to Joshua. Verse 21, when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had captured the city and that the smoke of the city went up, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. And the others came out from the city against them so that they were in the midst of Israel, some on the side, some on that side, and Israel struck them down until there was left none that survived or escaped. But the king of Ai, they took alive and brought him near to Joshua. And now, that place of failure just this, our failures actually become this pile of ruins. Look at verse 28. So Joshua burned Ai and made it forever. A heap of ruins. As it is to this day. Ai means a heap of ruins. That's what it means. 
And the people of Israel came from the city of Bethel to conquer Ai. You know what Bethel means? The house of God. So it's from the house of God that we turn the strongholds of the enemy into a heap of ruins. It's a picture of how the Babylonian world system will actually be overthrown. I think through God's people actually just rising up and moving forward in faith, even after times of defeat, even after times of discouragement, we keep moving forward in faith and not even the gates of hell will be able to prevail against God's plan. And then we see sin hanging on the tree. Look at verse 29. And he hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening. And at sunset, Joshua commanded, and they took his body down from the tree and threw it at the entrance at the gate of the city and raised over it a great heap of stones which stands there to this day. And I think when I'm reading through this, I, I think the king of Ai represents the sin in all of us through the first Adam. Because we've all sinned. Every one of us has failed. We've all had sin in the camp. We've all had hidden sin like Achan in chapter 7. That, that turns into this stronghold of defeat. But the good news is Christ doesn't leave you there. Like that, that's the gospel. That Christ was actually put on a tree for us. And in faith, we were crucified with Christ. That means my sin and my shame and my guilt were put on that tree too. And that, that second Adam in me, hung on that tree. So when the sacrifice of Christ and the, and the holy smoke of that sacrifice was rising to the heavens, it was a sign to everyone around that the enemy has been defeated. The king of Ai, he died for his own sin. But Jesus, the King of Kings, the sinless one, died on behalf of sinners like me. So what do I do? I make a new commitment to the Lord. Joshua takes the people of Israel to a place called Shechem, which is about 30 miles away. This is where Moses gave his last sermon to the people of Israel, Deuteronomy 27. So Joshua actually returns there and he sets up this altar of thanksgiving. And even in that, there is a picture of the gospel at the end of this chapter because it's not based on works. Let me show you this, verse 30. At that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel, as is written in the book of the law of Moses, listen to this, an altar of uncut stones upon which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. So let me ask you a question. Why uncut stones? Why stones that no human tool was used on? Because it's a picture, right, that this isn't because of some human work or intervention that's going to save his people. It's not going to be of works lest anyone should boast. That's what it means, that no one's going to be able to stand in, in the glory of God's presence because of their own righteousness. That's the gospel. Now, I, I know that some people think that God grades on the curve. And you ask the average person, hey, you're going to go to heaven? They'll say, yeah, pretty good person. 
I mean, I'm not as bad as that person over there. So I think I'm okay. That's a religion based on works. Not on the gospel. You know, I heard it described years ago this way when um, Thomas Harris had come out with this book um, in the 70s. It popularized this concept of, I'm okay, you're okay. Have you heard of that? I'm okay, you're okay. And it basically had four segments to it. I'm okay, you're okay. Second part was, I'm okay, you're not okay. Third part was, I'm not okay, you're okay. And the fourth part was, I'm not okay, and you're not okay. And the whole idea of the book was to get to this point where I'm okay and you're okay. But the gospel is that you're not okay. And I'm not okay. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, that's okay. <laughs> that when you get Jesus in your life, he, he bestows his righteousness upon you. He justifies you and makes you right with God so that you become a living stone based on what he does. Not based on you cutting your own stone. He's making you into a living stone uncut by human hands. That's what it means. It's not based on works, and it's established on the word of God. Look at this, verse 32. There in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. Right on those stones... He writes the law of God. Verse 34, afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curse according to all that is written in the books of the law. He reads it aloud. Do you know how long it would take to read the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah or the Pentateuch? About 12 to 15 hours. So don't tell me my sermons are too long, all right? So, But why do they do that? Because it's the Word of God. You know, the, the Bible is more than just a book. It's, it's God's Word breathed out by Him for our instruction, for our correction, for our encouragement, and for our growth. The Word of God, it's, it's alive, it's living, it's active, it's like a double-edged sword that can divide asunder even your soul and your spirit. It can actually judge the, the thoughts and the attitudes of your heart. That's why we're here today. That's why we're reading these words. It's it's spiritual food. Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So just as you cannot survive without food, you cannot thrive spiritually without regularly feeding on the word of God. Because this is what's going to guide you. This is what's going to direct you. Because the world is filled with so many conflicting opinions and, and all of this moral confusion, but God's word actually gives you guidance. It gives you direction. It's, it's, it's like a compass. It's a roadmap for every decision and challenge that you face. It'll transform you by the renewing of your mind. It's the greatest weapon that you have against the enemy. Take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he said over and over, it is written, it is written, it is written. It's what will bring you into a deeper sense of intimacy with God than anything else because this is not just a book of instructions. It's the way to know God's heart it's the no, way to know his character. And listen to me in this. It's the way to know how much he loves you. He 
He doesn't leave you in your failure. No. He says, I'll go up on the tree and die in your place. That's our Lord. Let's all bow our heads and pray. Oh God, forgive us Forgive us for so many times being apathetic to your word. Or even trying to go around AI and not facing it. I pray that through your spirit you would reveal what that AI is in our life. I know, Lord, that we're not alone. And I thank you that you, you tell us over and over, do not fear. Do not be dismayed. You're with us. And just knowing that you're with us, that you're our Emmanuel, that's all we need. Lord, we love you. It's by your grace that we're saved. It's by your mercy that's new every morning that we can face the failures of the past and walk in victory. Thanks for bringing us here today to remind us of that.